It's amazing the uh, freedom and liberty we have here in America when we see a majority of the people in the world today who are being persecuted for their faith. There's a scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 26, that says, The church is one body of believers. If one member suffers, all suffer together. For if one member is honored, we all rejoice together. And so you've got to realize that um, we're not uh, to think that, well, those people in different countries who don't have the freedom of liberty we have, that's uh, not of our concern. And it needs to be, as I mentioned in the conclusion of this videotape, it says that they're praying for us. And so likewise, we need to pray for them and support them. And so we need to realize that our relationship with God is more than just here in our community and and within our state, but that we have a responsibility to stand by, with faith and prayer for those who are not as unfortunate as we are. Uh, when you look at the book of Revelation in the sixth chapter, uh, it talks about what's happening that day and time for many of the Christians who are suffering tremendously and are being martyred. They said during the time of the Roman Empire, they estimated that three million Christians lost their lives. And we think, well, those things are not happening today. They're happening more so now, today, than it has been in the history of the world. And that there are a lot of people who are still standing for their faith, worshiping and believing God, and suffering tremendously. In the book of Revelation, the, the interesting thing is that that book was written at that point in time, but also is progressive in speaking to you and me today that uh, people who were martyred then and suffered for their faith in Christ, that there were 60 countries, 195 countries in the world, 60 of them, where there is persecution and hostility towards those who stand for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It says in Revelation that there's a cry that goes out. They were saying back in the first century, God, where's the justice? When is there going to be uh, social justice? When will you take vengeance upon those who falsely accuse us and persecute us and kill us? And the word of the Lord sometimes is not what we want to hear. Sometimes we find ourselves, even ourselves, in a tough place and it looks like our world's being turned upside down. We wonder where, where God is at times. Why doesn't he correct all the wrong? And, and why doesn't he deal with the evil that's so predominant in the world? The answer to evil is there is a life in Christ Jesus. When a person comes to Christ and they stop <clears throat> trying to figure out all the answers and just say, Lord, by faith, I don't understand everything. But you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put my faith and trust in you. Lord, I know that this is not the end, and that the sun is going to shine brighter in the days ahead. And even when we step into eternity, Lord, that everyone steps into that place in eternity, either in the presence of God or in total isolation, separation. And no one wants to be in that place of darkness. But we all want to come to that place where we know that God has forgiven us and cleansed us and given us hope beyond the grave. And he says to these saints at that time, I want to reassure you, I'm giving you a white robe. That right robe <clears throat> symbolizes the fact that you're pure, you're righteous, you're complete, you're whole. It's not something you earn, it's something that God gives to you. And that's called the gift of salvation. And just like right now, I'm receiving this drink of water <clears throat> to clear my throat. So salvation has come to me right now. <laughs> oh, that's good. And so... He gives a white robe, reassures that God is going to take care of us and that we have hope and that he's going to not only resolve every issue here in our lives, but all over the world for those who call on the name of the Lord. <coughs> he says, 
Not only this, he says to these saints in that first century who were suffering severe persecution. And the saints in Pakistan where this was happening. In Somalia, Sudan, and Iraq, and Syria, northern Africa, different places in Asia. He says, be patient until the completion of martyrdom is completed in the earth. Sometimes I don't want to hear that word. <laughs> be patient. When you're dealing with a, a situation in your life, you're wondering, God, when are you going to release healing in my body? When am I going to be able to get rid of this uh, situation of financial distress and hardship where you're dealing with a family issue, with a child who's gone astray, or a grandchild, or whatever you're contending with? God is a God who answers prayer. God will come and heal, work in our hearts and lives and resolve, the, resolve these difficult issues. And he says, be patient until the completion of my time. Just think recently, this past week, Pastor Andrew Brunson, two years in a prison in Turkey, falsely accused of being a terrorist. A terrorist because he was preaching the gospel for 23 years in Turkey. Going along and everything is fine, then all of a sudden he's snatched up and used as a pawn, as an instrument of a situation in Turkey, which is one of our allies in NATO, but also a strong Muslim nation. And Christianity poses a threat because it tells people you can be in a situation where it's dark and gloomy and yet have hope that you can have freedom. People can be in prison for the faith, but still in the heart and mind, they are free in Christ Jesus. And so God is reassuring people who are suffering persecution. I would pray that that would never happen in our lifetime. But it seems like here in America, the door is beginning to close in our religious freedoms and liberties, what we stand for, the truth of God's word. We stand for the sanctity of marriage, the sanctity of life. And those things are being opposed, where now we see in our culture this redefining things that for centuries have been the norm, our moral values, our, the truth of God's word, our freedom and liberty. <clears throat> Recently I went to a school in the Soviet, former Soviet Union, Ukraine, and had the liberty to preach the gospel in a public school. Amen. 300 young people talk to them about Jesus, presented the gospel, wasn't planning to do that, it happened, it just happened. And the response was every single one of them raised their hand. Amen. The teachers and the principals applauded it. We can't do that in America. And we think, you know, we'll never have to contend with what's happening in Sudan as far as our faith goes, or Pakistan. And if we don't take a stand and, and proclaim the truth of the gospel and are willing to endure difficulty and hardship, that the enemy can just run roughshod over us. But I believe that the true elect of God, you, others, will say, for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord God, right. even if it costs me, my reputation, my life, whatever. Because there's an eternity that we're going to stand before God and contend with. Amen? God's promise. He says in Revelation chapter 5, verses 15 through 17. He said, the Lord will cover us, lead us, and wipe away every tear. Evidently, momentarily, in eternity, there may be some tears because the things we realize and contend with. But God comes and wipes away every tear and makes everything right. Now, I don't know what your eschatology is concerning end times, if you're pre-millennial, post-om, pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, preterist, all millennials, whatever. One professor said, in the end, we all end up at the same place. Amen. There's a new heaven and a new earth, a new Jerusalem, the, the bride coming down to meet that room, the Lord Jesus Christ. Some people want to intellectualize those things and try to reason those things out. You cannot reason God out with the human mind because the human mind 
is finite. By faith, I accept the truth of God's word. By faith, I say, God, you know what's right. In the end, you do everything that's correct and true. And so I accept it. Amen? You walk by faith. That means you put your trust in God. Not based upon reason and intellect. It's based upon a spiritual thing. We say yes to you, Lord. Here's what I believe. I don't know what is in the days ahead. My life is near the end. Amen? 71 years of age. Hallelujah. So it may be here 10 more years, 15, maybe 20, maybe less. But my concern is for my children and grandchildren, great-grandchildren. I don't think I'm so wide. Excuse me. This makes it real and human, eh, amen? There's a scripture in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 3. If you have your Bibles or iPhone, you turn there. It says, Remember them that are in bonds, as bound with them, and them which suffer adversity, as being yourselves also in that body. It means identify with those, even though we don't know their names, even though we're not in Pakistan. You see these people as second class citizens, a guy cleaning out a sewer pit. Being a servant, and making bricks. Most of the world does not live as we do. When you travel to Eastern Europe, or you travel to the Near East, or Asia, when you look at how much money they make, I was talking to a lieutenant colonel been in the military for 20 years. He probably makes about $8,000 a year, and that's a high standard of living in Ukraine. Could you live on $8,000 a year here in America? Now, the fuel prices there were just as high or higher than what it is here. In Haiti, which is a poverty nation, abject poverty, fuel prices, when I was last time I was there, $67 a gallon. And so you say, well, their standard of living, the costs are a lot less than ours, not necessarily so. And so, when I look at the world, when it talks about the rich man, how difficult it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Now, we think about rich man maybe being a multi-millionaire. But compared to the world's standards, if you make $25,000 a year, you make more than 90% of the people in the world. If you make $50,000 a year, you make more than 95%. One of the most difficult things for people in America to put their faith and trust in God is for them to realize that their wealth does not buy them eternity. And wealth sometimes, monetary things, material things, will distract a person and cause them to think, well, why do I need God? I get a good job, a nice house, extended credit. And I'm, that's, so the Bible says it's difficult for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And one of the best ways to deal with materialism and greed is to become generous and to be a giver. Amen? and to be a blessing to others. Using wisdom discretion. Amen? There's a man named Richard Warbrand who spent 14 years in a Romanian prison when it was under communism. He was a pastor and he took a stand for the truth. He was tortured and thrown into jail. He wrote a book called Torture for Christ. And he said this, you need to enlarge your horizons, sharing the joys and the sorrows of your fellow man. And so, in the late 1960s, he came to the West after he was released and started preaching in the West to churches. And his message was a hard message. He was talking about those who were suffering, being persecuted for their faith in Christ Jesus. 
And during that time, the late 60s, there was war protest and people wanting to follow Marxism and socialism and things like that. So he was rejected for a great deal for what his message was proclaiming and saying. And he said this, I have suffered more from the complacency of the West than from the communists. And then God, he prevailed and persevered and started a ministry called the Voice of the Martyrs, VOM. Recently, uh, David and I attended a seminar at a church nearby where they did a presentation. Started uh, receiving their uh, newsletters and following them on the website and realized that uh, we need as a church to extend our horizons. That we need to realize that we're part of something that's bigger than just here in Woodstock. That we are connected with a large body of believers, the body of Christ. Just not here in Woodstock, not just here in the United States, but in the world. We need to stand in prayer with our brothers and sisters who are suffering and need to identify with them and pray for them. Uh, interesting, when you read the stories, and I read the book, The Insanity of God, how God uses suffering and persecution to extend the church and to reach those who are even being instruments of torture. And what happens a lot of times when people find themselves in prison for their faith, instead of just wanting to be delivered, God gives them compassion to reach out to those who are torturing them, who are ridiculing them, who are persecuting them. And they begin to pray for these people. And then God begins to move in a glorious way, taking their suffering and their pain and using it to win those who are torturing them to Christ and become a testimony. You see it happening over and over. And so what they say, Lord, you're worthy. You're worthy, Lord God, for me to take this position to stand. And Lord, that you use me in my time of imprisonment to enlarge your kingdom. I wondered and often thought, if I was placed in that place, if, if I was in Pakistan, and the only life I had was to clean out a sewer pit or to make bricks, can I do that? Would I be tempted to say, Jesus is not my Lord, I'm not a Christian. I'll submit to Hinduism. I'll submit to Islam so I can save my own flesh. Then I have to ask that question. Is Jesus worth it? Is a servant above the master? Can I shrink from my responsibility to stand for truth and stand for the faith? The only way that I could do what that man in Pakistan did when he dropped down in that sewer pit to take that nasty stuff out was that God graced me. What I mean by grace is that he gives you the power of the Holy Ghost to do what you can't do, to be what you can't be, that he enables you and empowers you and graces you to even lay down your life to suffer. See, that part of the gospel we don't want to hear. I remember back years ago hearing televangelists say, you don't have to suffer for Jesus because he's already suffered for you, paid the price, so suffering is not of God, it's of the devil. When I look at Revelation, it says, you've got to be patient because there's many more who are going to be martyred and are going to suffer. Not only in the first century, the second, third, fourth, right on down to the 21st century. More people now are suffering for the sake of of standing for the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ and has been in years gone by. I want to hope that I'm worthy to be obedient to the Lord that if my life is threatened that he give me the grace to say I am not going to bend my knee to Islam. 
I'm not going to bend my knee to Hinduism. I'm not going to bend my knee to a totalitarian regime. I'm not going to bend my knee to ungodliness. I'm going to do what's right. I'm not going to yield and submit to the temptation of the enemy that I would take my marriage and destroy it for committing a sin of adultery. I'm not going to put myself in a position of lying or stealing or cheating or taking the way of the world. I'm not going to entertain any form of godliness. I'm going to walk a holy, godly life. I live for God. Amen. I serve God. He's my Savior. He's my Lord. He's King of Kings. He's Lord of Lords. He deserves the best. Amen. He deserves me to call out to Him. He deserves that I can trust Him to heal me, to strengthen me, to deliver me, to life me. He deserves the best. He deserves my life. I'm going to decrease so He can increase. I'm going to walk worthy. And then people look at my life, look at your life, and they see Christ in me, the hope of glory. Amen? I'm not going to become a reproach of disgrace. I'm going to do the right thing. I'm going to say, God, I love you. I serve you no matter what. I'm going to walk with you each and every day. I'm not going to do what other people will do. I'm going to stand firm. I'm going to do the right thing. Amen? You see, sometimes... The persecution is right before us. The enemy wants to mock us, destroy our lives, our character, our testimony. When we take the easy way and not the strict, narrow way. Amen? One of the most profound and important things we need to do as a church, for the church to grow, to see every seat filled, to see a parking lot problem, not only in this house, but down the road, down the road, down the road, across this way. There are people here who are on the road to ruin. And when we see an opportunity of the Holy Ghost at work, we need to see that open door. We need to step in it. We need to say, I want to tell you something. There's something a lot better than what you're living and doing right now. I want to tell you that there is a lot better life. There's a thing called the abundant life. So Jesus said, I come to give you life, but to give it to you more abundantly. I want to know that when I lay my head down on the pillow at night, that I can get up in the morning and rejoice and lift my hands, no matter if everything is going sideways and everything being turned upside down, I know that my God will cover me, lead me, and guide me. I know that my son Garrett, my grandson, even though he wants to be a Calvary scout and do reconnaissance and go into a hostile environment and search out the enemy and report back that he won't get taken out by the enemy. The God will protect him from making foolish decisions. And there's other young men who are connected to this church who are being Right now, Stephanie's husband, Drew, is going to Afghanistan soon. And his first sergeant, Timmy Boyd, who I just saw this weekend, is going also. And then Eric and Jan's grand uh, son-in-law is going to Afghanistan. We need to pray for these young men. I, pray, I believe, just like in the book of Hosea, you can pray a shield of protection around them that no weapon formed against them will prosper. I need to get out of my little circle of life and influence to see that my horizon is extended, that I can pray for that dear man in Pakistan, even though I don't know him. Amen. I can call on the name of Jesus, that God will give him strength to prevail and get out of that thing and also not only pray, but we as a church, that we can come and pull our resources together that we can put some arms and legs on our prayer and give financial support to the persecuted church. Get the word of God in the hands of people. Amen? So, we have a part. We need to pray for these people. We need to put a name on some of these people that God impresses upon our heart and mind. Now, I didn't confer with David Wolfinger ahead of time, but I'm going to uh, just trust you that he's on the same page with me and we attended this seminar that he can be our liaison person 
and our contact person to inform us and keep us up to date. And then also church that we come alongside and that financially we can make a difference and participate in supporting those saints who are suffering and being persecuted to let them know that they are not for God. That's one of the worst things I hear when I read about people suffering in these difficult, hostile places that they will not be forgiven. Amen? So I want to take a vote. We wish we normally don't do because we're a theocracy, but I want to know, will you pray for the persecuted church? Will you be willing to allow me as your pastor to take some of our tithes and offerings and that we support the persecuted church? Amen? That, uh, David, would you help me our liaison person? I put him on the spot looking at him. What you going to say? No. <laughs> Cindy's over there. Get him in the ribs. You will do it. Amen. If you're in agreement with me, raise your hand. Amen. Father, you see these hands and hearts. Lord, we realize that you're extending our horizons today. That we want to let the persecuted church, our brothers and sisters, are suffering for the sake of Christ. That they are not alone. We stand with them. And Lord, we put, Lord God, some arms and legs on our prayers and we ask God that you just touch us, burden us with this responsibility. We pray, God, that many will come to the saving grace and knowledge of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a big hand. Amen.